I want to go over the political, some of this has changed because uh, it's, a, it's a, an extremely tense political situation. Um, I think that without a doubt, uh, this is one of the great crises in certainly human history, recorded human history. Uh, 6,000 years. I, I'm not going to try to compare every crisis, but this, this ranks with one of the, because everything at one level is going wrong at the same time. And at the same time, we have the potential for, and that's why we in some ways started with Lane, uh, we have the potential for a complete change in the direction of history. And we have some examples I'll refer to, uh, not that they're the only example or the most important example, but uh, examples of cases where we either did change the course of history or nearly changed the course of history. And probably the most recent example uh, I'm gonna, uh, is, uh, I'll refer to John Kennedy, uh, but one of the, the really most recent example where we had our hands on changing history was the end of World War II. Now I realize there's a lot of different age brackets here and um, some of it may not be familiar to some of the younger people uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, but at, at the end of World War II, and I'll come back to this because of the political situation, Franklin Roosevelt had a certain conception of what he had done to get out of the Depression and a certain conception of what he had done uh, along with others to succeed in defeating fascism and militarism uh, typified by Nazi Germany and the Japanese. But he also knew that indeed what had caused fascism in Europe in particular, we, we were threatened with it in the United States, but we have to face the fact that Europe was by the, by the time of the Nazi invasion of Poland in 1939, Europe was brown from the tip of the Italian boot to the occupation in Holland and Denmark, Norway and uh, France was 80% fascist. So he also recognized that we had to have a new global system a new global economic system. And there's a lot of confusion about this because Roosevelt died. And I would say that the British knew that Roosevelt was going to die. He was a very, he was, they didn't kill him. He was a sick person. He had severe arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, and hypertension, uh, high blood pressure. And he was a paraplegic. The, uh, there's not that many paraplegics that live past 60 or 65. Ro Roosevelt died at about 62 years old. And the British medical staff was completely aware of Roosevelt's condition. Now, I'm, I'm saying that what did happen was that the British policy under Churchill and the monarchy was to extend the war. To keep, they expected the war in the Pacific to last well into the late 1940s. And this is on the record. And they thought that the war in uh, Europe could be extended for at least six months to a year. And of course, we all know historically, Churchill and the British were completely against the landing at Normandy. They were against opening up the Western Front. They even tried to sabotage the Normandy landing Afterwards, that is, Montgomery uh, insisted on going up to Holland, some not too far from here, and created a, an effective cat catastrophic diversion, which slowed the, uh, the Allies and so on and so forth. But Roosevelt, before he died, had tried to set into motion a different conception of the United Nations, uh, he, was he was totally opposed to the British Empire, whether he was opposed to the central banking system, 
which is why they put together the Bretton Woods Conference, which only di didn't really succeed in part, again, because Roosevelt, who was the actual animating figure, was gone. But the idea was the development of the newly decolonized sections of the world. One, one interesting example was, of course, uh, and, and not that this wasn't a fight in the United States, but in the late 1930s, uh, Roosevelt committed the United States to the liberation of the Philippines. Now, a lot of people thought he wouldn't do it or he would delay it after World War II. But indeed, in 1946, the Philippines were liberated. That's the closest thing to the US that the US ever had to a colony. The US was not a colonial power. It was not an imperial power. Sometimes people get confused between power and empire. The British have ruled an empire to this day, the Anglo-Dutch. And it has a certain continuity that goes all the way back to Rome. <laughs> And the Roman families moved north when the, when the empire collapsed. Where did Rome come from? Rome was really uh, what came out of an agglomeration of empires. There was a series of battles over the Hittite Empire, the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Greek, the Macedonian Empire. Uh, Alexander the Great was the only one who had an idea of developing anything. Finally, this ended up with the division of Alexander's empire and ultimately the success of Rome. The Punic Wars leading to the founding of the Roman Empire about 27 BC or 47 BC. The Roman Empire lasted for 400 years as a complete, as a dominant empire stretching essentially from India into Northern Europe, including North Africa. Now the tradition in Europe since then has been a control by an oligarchy, by what is effectively a financial empire. That oligarchy moved uh, its center to Amsterdam, ultimately London, and we consider Wall Street to be an extension of this. Now, uh, I think there's an interesting irony in what we face, because remember, it, it, because Denmark is, is a relatively small country. Uh, it has its own kind of powers, but it's a relatively small country. So the question always comes up, and I have gotten this in the few weeks I've been here, what can we in Denmark as a small country do? Now, there, there may be a funny side to this, because if you sort of internally answer that question, not much, then you have the excuse to take benefits of Denmark. You know, it's a pleasant country. It's fairly well to do under the circumstances. But I don't think any place on the planet is going to avoid this crisis. You know, there's the famous story in the United States of, uh, I don't know, it's probably not true, but it, it makes a point, that there was an individual who uh, wanted, he knew World War II was coming, and he decided to find some place where he could go that would be untouched by the crisis that was so far out of the normal pathway that it would never be affected. And so he went to the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal. Well, anybody who knows the history of the Pacific War, probably some of the most intense warfare. Thousands died in the battle over the Solomon Islands and Guadalcanal. So there's no place to run. There's really no place to hide. Now, I think it's interestingly ironic that the answer to the question, what can people do in Denmark, has come to us in a very funny way, a sort of strange way, or potentially disastrous way, because we are on the brink of a potential expansion of the war uh, into Syria. But this is, and it's not about Syria, I'll, I'll come back to that. But there could be a strike at Syria under this uh, guise of pe penalizing uh, Assad for the chemical weapons. Frankly, the overall issue of was there chemical weapons and who used them is a lot less relevant than people think. Because you don't carry out serious strategic policy by punishing 
the head of a country by bombing the country in order to make a point. Never in history has a population simply conceded because they were bombed into concession. Or certainly it took a long time to do it. A long time. In the case of uh, Serbia in 1999, it took 78 days of bombing to get them to pull out of Kosovo. So these things don't cause surrender. So the idea that this is a, a strategic move or something that's necessitated by some question of morality is wrong. What's the morality of killing civilians because you use the wep because you use chemical weapons? Now the truth of the matter is even further than that. But I think the irony is, because we're at this brink, and because the Prime Minister of Denmark has essentially announced that she would be part of a coalition of the willing, as it was called in the case of Iraq, that Denmark would take a part in some aspect of the military operation against Syria. And that the foreign minister, who I guess had previously been something of an opposition, or at least seemed to be opposed to military action, has now said that he uh, indicated that he would frankly cave in, as we say in English, capitulate, go along with it. And of course, Denmark has been involved in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, and so on. So therefore, if the Danish population decided that this time we won't let it happen, then Danish citizens might have a very important role to play in the actions of small numbers of people to stop this war. Because you don't ever say it, we can't stop it. Part of what the press wants to do, it, what the <coughs> propaganda is, is it's inevitable. It, the decision's been made. It's just a question of what hour and what day. And then you say, wherever you are, including in the United States, what can we do about it? It's a done deal. It's just going to happen. And most people give in to that. The reality is, it's not necessarily going to happen until it happens. Nothing else counts. And I can report to you that there has been action against the war in the United States. One quarter of the congressmen in the United States have sent a letter to Obama, who is a warmonger, basically. This idea that he's reluctant is, is not true. This is his policy. And so uh, they sent a letter to Obama saying that you cannot undertake military action in Syria without consulting with the Congress. And the Congress should be called immediately back into session. Now that's a quarter, we need half, we need two thirds. But it indicates that this is not something that the entire American population is for. I would say quite the opposite. At this time, the American population is a war weary population. It's been one war after another. And this is coming in the midst of a collapse of what, what, I, what the transatlantic financial system. That is what's driving this crisis completely, is that the basic post-1971, and I'm being very explicit, in 1971, we moved to a floating exchange system. We moved to a, you know, off of any kind of uh, gold reserve system. We also reached a point where the dollar which had been playing a reserve role under uh, the fixed exchange rate, under the Bretton Woods agreements, which were only half accomplished, the dollar was, of course, blowing out. We had what they called, we entered stagflation. From that point on, we have existed under a purely monetarist system. The, the question of capitalism is barely relevant. Uh, capitalism doesn't exist uh, in, in any real form. The issue is a system of physical economic development 
the growth system of the, what was, we've called the American system, the system that has succeeded in the United States against the efforts of the financial forces to destroy it, including Wall Street. Wall Street was set up by the British. These are people loyal to the British. J.P. Morgan's family was originally the contractors for the British in the United States, and you could go on and on. The fact of the matter is, they hate the American system, the system of Alexander Hamilton, the system of Abraham Lincoln, the system of Franklin Roosevelt. This is a system based on ongoing, future-oriented, scientific and technological growth. Now, these, these, there are too many stories to go into in detail, but I'm referring to that. Every time the United States has leaped forward, has succeeded, it's because after generally decades of capitulation to the, to the British financial system, we have turned back to what Alexander Hamilton did after the revolution, where we, did, we had a national bank, not a central bank. And we set up a credit system, which offered credit to certain def, uh, defined projects, canals, water management, power, the, uh, everything that developed across the United States. In fact, one great irony of this was in the middle of the Civil War in the United States, Lincoln, who was an American system economics uh, uh, promoter, ordered the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And by the end of the Civil War, that project was underway. By 1869, the United States, the continental United States, had been bound together in some form of unity. That's what Roosevelt did. What Roosevelt did, what we refer to as Class-Steagall, is when Roosevelt passed an emergency banking act within about 100 days of taking office. That banking act set up the entire regulatory system and separated commercial from investment banks. And what that means is you can't speculate with basic commercial banking deposits. That's essentially a monetarist system. What do I mean by a monetarist system? A system that's based on the value of money. That is, in the, in the instant, in the present, does the value of a financial instrument grow? That's how come you, think about it, how do you make money in an economy overnight? It's impossible, nothing gets built overnight. You can transfer a certain amount of information but you can't produce anything overnight that's of value. Yet, you can make millions of dollars on arbitrage, on speculative bets, in an instant. There's absolutely nothing economic in it. Monetarism is essentially a means of using financial value to loot the physical economy, to steal from the physical economy. Because the growth instantaneously is based on cheapening the cost of labor, which, by the way, is the core of fascism. Anytime you decide that you're not going to invest enough to reproduce the population, you're not going to have activity that's capable of reproducing the existing population and more, at the existing standard of living, you're one step, or you're, a ma you're the major step, down the road to fascism. The, the rest is all detail, as somebody once said. You can have red hats, brown hats, green boots, no boots. You know, the, the financier of fascism, uh, Hjalmar Schacht, wore suits. He didn't wear jack boots. That's not what it takes. So what we've seen, and uh, Copenhagen was the center of something else, I think about four years ago, roughly. 2009, was it? Yeah. yeah. And, and at the end of the year, in 2009, there was a big ecology conference here. Envir it was, I think it was the follow-up to Rio, the Rio conference, or one of those conferences. There was supposed to be an international conference of agreement on lowering the carbon footprint of the human population. 
What does that mean? Lamy went through some of this. This is complete insanity. However, in this case, the Chinese, some of the other underdeveloped countries, uh, the Brazilians, all said, no, we won't go along with this. During this, the royal family, now remember, who are some of the biggest, when I say the royal family, this is a, a touchy area you know, in Europe, and particularly the British, but maybe even here, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, what, what, did, what did the monarch, who were the biggest representatives of environmentalism? Prince Charles, Prince Philip, the founder of the World Wildlife Federation, Prince Bernard, now deceased, also a co-founder of uh, the World Wildlife Fund. And at this conference, the British monarchy, in the name of the Queen, uh, said that their policy is to reduce the world's population from 7 billion to, you know, it depends, 1 billion, 2 billion. It, it doesn't make that much difference. The number isn't, because once you say you're going to reduce the world's population by billions, you've set the human species on the road to extinction. You don't stop that kind of process. Disease, starvation, war. So we're, the, the entire strategic war threat that we face is part of the policy of destruction. And you know, people used to know that depression, financial chaos, and war tend to go together. The difference today is we're facing a situation where war, any kind of general war, is unthinkable. It's been unthinkable since the end of World War II. Lyndon LaRouche has made this point strenuously, particularly over the last couple of years, and you know that we, we, we cannot afford to run the risk of general warfare among, between nations of power. Because what, what it means is nuclear, conf, nuclear conflict or thermonuclear conflict. And less than, look, we've lived under this for 70 years almost, 65, 70 years. There was a time when people knew at the end of World War II, when the first two atomic bombs were dropped, which should have never happened, but when, that, when it was dropped, the scientists and many of the military people, including people like General MacArthur, General Eisenhower, the father of the American atomic bomb, Robert Oppenheimer, all knew then that with these kinds of weapons, general warfare was the extinction of the human species. And I don't mean that lightly. Maybe a few people might survive and we might start the whole thing all over again. I don't know. But you're talking about an event that would put at risk the existence of the human species. And this is something I think particularly the younger generation hasn't had to consider. We've lived under this idea, there's one superpower, it may, they may get out of control periodically, but it's, you know, it's a little war, war here and a little war there, and it doesn't lead to anything. We're not, that's simply not the case. The Russians, for example, if they reach a certain point where they feel surrounded, contained, where China feels surrounded, when their voice is not heard on anything, on economic policy, on political relations, they only have one choice. They're not going to engage in a conventional war that they're going to lose. They're not going to wait to see what the other side does. And one thing about nuclear weapons, you use them or you lose them. You don't get a second bite at the apple. And this is something that people have not considered for a long time. It, when when uh, the, the uh, war against Libya began, Lyndon LaRouche said immediately then that, first of all, the objective was not Libya. The objective is to move on to Syria, Iran, and ultimately force, try to force a back down of Russia, China, etc., as some of their allies are involved in this. Now, you know, LaRouche's record on these kinds of forecasts are remarkable, and they're not done willy-nilly, or they're not done without thought. They're not done all the time. The other interesting forecast of the recent period, and this is part of 
the way the human mind works when it's thinking. And this is something that LaRouche has been uh, writing about recently. What's the nature of human creativity? The, the ability of the human individual to think into the future, to think about what we might face a year from now, five years from now, what, is, what are the activity of human beings and the ideas of human beings, what are they leading us to? And what things need to be in? It's the nature of the human species. We use nature. That, they, they, there's no way we cannot do it. You look around the room, it, nothing in this room is natural. Probably nothing in the entire confines of Copenhagen is natural. Actually, most of the forests and the grasses and the flowers and the animals and everything that you run into is not natural if your definition of natural is it has nothing to do with human beings. The idea that human beings are artificial, that we're some kind of spooky existence from another universe. Maybe people believe we, we came through a wormhole from a multiverse or something along those lines. You know, we were created by this universe. So we're as natural as anything else is. That doesn't mean we can be unthinking. But our ability to discern the laws or the principles that govern nat nature gives us a certain power to act upon nature. And it requires us to develop the powers of the human species itself, because the more we uh, discover about nature, the more we use, the more people we need to support our efforts to increase what we've referred to as the energy flux density. What that means is you're, you basically are applying more of human capabilities to a smaller and smaller area, which means you're opening up elements of nature that you didn't know existed before. Probably the leading example of this is nuclear physics. In 1880, 1870, we didn't know that it even existed. We didn't know about isotopes that we use in medicine. We didn't even know these kinds of things. We didn't know what radiation was. It took us a long time to find these things out. And it gave us a certain power in nature to do things we couldn't otherwise do. Now, in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in 2007, LaRouche, when all this, uh, the housing bubble, the real estate bubble, broke in the United States, actually right before it broke, uh, LaRouche did a webcast where he said that the bubble is going to burst, the housing bubble is unsustainable, and the entire financial system is going to go through a collapse. And indeed, the housing bubble burst within a few days. And about a year later, we had Lehman Brothers and so on and so forth. And we're living through this now. I don't know, you know, I, I don't, look, at, look at the situation in the European Union, or in, the, let's say, the Eurozone. Greece, Spain, Portugal, Cyprus. Now the, the new story is you, we're, we're not going to uh, go to the taxpayer but if you have a deposit in this bank, we're going to take it, the so-called bail-in. No, and what, is the, what does the European Union actually mean? It means a lack of sovereignty. It means that some supranational bureaucracy is going to tell nations what to do. Now, clearly in Europe, we have had a complete imbalance of situations in different parts of the Eurozone in the, in the European Union itself, but the Eurozone in particular. And so this doesn't work. Now, I, I know that the Danes voted against being part of the Eurozone. But you have to look at the world as it exists. Germany, France, all these countries, Italy, are in desperate economic shape, even Germany. In the United States, it's, it's almost indescribable because the United States is a power. It's also a republic. It's really the only republic that's ever been formed. And it came from Europe. It came from Europe 
because really a, for after the defeat of certain people after the Renaissance, the only place to go, as Cardinal Cusa put it, was to go to, uh, to the New World and build a republic on these principles. So we have this. We have we had this collapse. Detroit, uh, Laney mentioned it. But I, I, you know, here I don't know how much people know and don't know. But so you have to pardon me uh, or excuse me if if I'm being redundant. But um, Detroit is not your average. Is not a normal. It's not just a city. Detroit was the fourth largest city in the United States. It was almost two million people. It was the center of the, the machine tool capability, the industrial capability of the United States for the entire period from the mid-1920s, but particularly during and after World War II. This is, where the, the, this is the core of where the famous build, it, build anything industry. It really wasn't an automobile industry. They built tanks. They built airplanes. They built engines. They built jeeps. They built ships. And they play cool music. Uh, Detroit? Well, that's, Motown is not up my alley. So, uh, the, uh, but, but, um, so this city is now 670,000 people. 40% of the buildings are desolate. There's nobody living there, nobody maintaining it. 40%, I'm not talking about 40% of a certain kind of building. I'm talking about 40% of the structures in the city are boarded up, holes in them, fires, lawns that haven't been touched in years. Something like 40 or 50% of the street lights don't work. So it's like a ghost town. It's almost like a ghost town, or it's the beginning of a ghost town. And of course, it's extremely impoverished. The average age is well over 50 years. Crime rates. Crime rates. It well, the, the, the real story, there's been so many cutbacks, it takes the police 58 minutes to respond to a call. That's a little late. They just, well, you, you call the police department up and they say, just wait a little while, we'll be, we'll be out there. But, uh, you know, the same thing is true for the fire department. It's not quite as bad. But, uh, and, and, you could, and this is not atypical. And I'm not talking about rural cities. I'm talking about major industrial cities, Cleveland, Buffalo. What's happened to some of these cities is they've, tur they've turned it into entertainment zones. They've taken the, the former port or the former steel uh, plant, and they've turned them into park, you know, uh, amusement parks or entertainment zones, casinos, and so on and so forth. And this is, this, is, this is a consequence of a system which intentionally creates this kind of mentality in the population. What do most people think? I mean, all these things are of a piece. Uh, you know, uh, uh, behaviorism, so-called. The pleasure-pain principle is all that's supposed to guide the economy. In fact, what's the basic view of the economy? If we don't, if you let, don't let your pleasure or your avoidance of pain guide your choices, then you're interfering in the market. What do they mean by interfering in the market? That means you have an idea of what you should be doing with your economic capabilities. You have some conception of the future that you want to bring into existence, that you know is necessary. So any idea, forget this isn't Soviet planning. This is simply the idea of what are the essential things that we can point to that we need to develop in the economy that become the guiding points of the direction of the economy around which private enterprise and so forth can make bids and can enter into contracts and the like. But you have, a, you have an idea of where the country has to go. You have a sense of that you live in the future. And when any scientific discovery is made, the same thing goes on. What did Einstein do? He had an idea of what he thought our conception of the universe must necessarily be for us to progress any further. 
He knew we needed a certain further development of the uh, concepts of the electromagnetic field. In fact, his famous paper on special relativity is entitled uh, on motion in, of the, uh, uh, on uh, something, it's, it actually refers to the motion of, in an electrodynamic process. That's what it's about. It's not about the speed of light in itself. It's about the nature of electrodynamics, electromagnetic phenomena. And we needed to know certain things. So he, what was he? He wasn't at a university. He was a patent clerk. He couldn't get a university job. Not one that was decent enough. Others did come out of the academic community, like Planck. But they, they were looking at solving problems that were necessary for the future development of humanity. You know, we have, we have examples of this that I happen to have the fortune to see in, in Denmark. We went to see the Ola Romer uh, exhibit out here, out of the sit, outside of the city. What did Romer do? He discovered the speed of light? What did that have to do with anything? Well, how practical was that in 16, the middle of the 17th century? To try to measure the speed of light? You know how difficult that was at that time? But he did it without the refined instruments that we have today. Because he thought of the significance of our understanding how nature works. What the law, principles, the universal principles of nature are. Or even, uh, you know, um, you have Ursa, even uh, Tuco Bra, who was a sort of a funny character. But uh, nonetheless, he was committed to mapping the heavens. And ultimately, this led to our knowledge of, uh, what, of Kepler's conception of the harmonies of the solar system. And, you know, Newton did a little algebra and claimed he discovered gravity, but that's, that's another story. All right? This is what living in the future means. This is what we were talking about. We have to think in terms of, it, it's not just a project for the United States. NAWAPA, NAWAPA 21, thermonuclear NAWAPA. This is the, to begin a process of development of the planet as a whole. It's to incorporate into these plans uh, the, the development of the Bering Strait, the development of the Arctic, which the Chinese, of course, consider to be important to their development. It means cutting travel times on the globe by enormous amounts, both passenger time, valuable freight time, low value freight, whatever you want, by ship, by rail, by air, whatever is necessary, finding the means to do this as effectively as possible. People have no idea how much of the cost of production is, involves transportation. In fact, you have to realize the more you move production to cheap labor sites, which also means that you can't produce anything of uh, technical value, you're also increasing the transportation costs, which means you have to lower the labor costs. So now they find China isn't cheap enough, they have to move to Bangladesh. If people worry about nuclear plants and Bangladesh, they lose over a thousand people in a garment plant where they're finding the cheapest labor they can find. That's the kind of process that's underway. That's what, even if we don't have nuclear war, which I'm not gonna, we're at the brink of it. There are people who wanna stop it. Tom mentioned the British Parliament. I mentioned some of the, Amer the American military is against it. But even if we succeed in stopping it, we're still gonna lose unless we change our entire conception of what it is to be a human being. Now, I think today's an interesting day for an Amer or at least a uh, period for an American because not only was, uh, I guess it was yesterday, uh, was the, um, yesterday or today? What's today's date? Yesterday. yesterday. It was the 50th anniversary of the Martin Luther King speech at the Washington, at the Lincoln Memorial, um, which of course is known throughout the, uh, many people know of it. It's also the 50th anniversary coming up of the assassination of John Kennedy. A man a few years later, his brother, and of course, in, uh, right before his brother, Martin Luther King himself. 
And by the way, this is part of American history. You know, Lincoln was assassinated. Garfield was assassinated. Uh, McKinley was assassinated. Huh? Uh, no, he lived to be almost 90. Uh, but um, uh, Hamilton was, in, was killed by Burr. I mean, and this wasn't violence in the United States. See, this is, this is one of these things that the British run. These were assassinations. They were political assassinations. When Lincoln was assassinated, everybody knew it was a conspiracy. Most people now have no idea of it. But, it, and again, these are other stories, but there were, people were convicted of being part of the conspiracy. Lincoln was not the only person attacked on that night. William Seward, the Secretary of State, was knifed. His son was almost killed. <coughs> the leading U.S. general, U.S. Grant, had, was targeted for assassination. He got sick and couldn't go to the theater, so he wasn't assassinated. Stanton, the, the Secretary of War, was attacked. All on the same night that Lincoln was killed. So it's no, it's no stretch to say this was a, a, a political assassination. Kennedy was assassinated. The interesting question is why? In part, it's because Kennedy represented a certain tie to the Roosevelt era. He was supported in the latter part of the campaign by Eleanor Roosevelt. He himself was uh, served under MacArthur in the Pacific and was a proponent of uh, the Roosevelt policy. Now, the interesting thing to me, well, the interesting thing to look at it will be the effects in the United States of these things coming together. Kennedy also had elements of an economic policy <laughs> that indicated an opposition to Wall Street. He stood up against the steel industry when they wanted to jack the price up. He, of course, announced the plan to go to the moon. And he also was in the process of deciding that he would not enter the Vietnam War. That is, he would not send troops into Vietnam. He consulted virtually, uh, well, not long before MacArthur died. He visited MacArthur, uh, who was a five-star American general uh, and led the, s the campaign in the South Pacific. He visited uh, MacArthur in, in, uh, in, in the hospital. And MacArthur told him absolutely no land wars in Asia. And it's pretty clear that Kennedy was not going to send US troops into Vietnam. Now think of what the Vietnam War meant. And I can tell you what it meant to the United States. It was the near destruction of the United States. We still suffer from the idiocy of the Vietnam War. We destroyed the military. We, depre we, we sent an entire generation on the, on, down the road of cultural oblivion, you know, the rock, drug, sex counterculture, which most people today think is the culture. I often say to some of the younger people, what you don't get is when I refer to the counterculture, that's the culture you grow up under. <coughs> free drugs, maybe not free, but relatively accessible. A little bit of free sex, maybe a lot of free sex, or maybe it's not accessible, but it's, you know, if, if you can't get sex in the present culture, it's your problem, not, uh, not the moral strictures. Some people may not believe that, but it's true. Anyway, the, uh, you know, it destroyed the country. And of course, it's what led to the introduction of the purely speculative post-1971 financial system, which is largely run by London and Wall Street. Now, what I want to do is give you one quick idea of what I mean by the difference, because I think for, certainly for Americans, it's striking how different the pre-1971 period is to the post-1971, just in the way people even thought of what the possibilities are.
go full screen.
sure what we are behind. And we'll be behind for some time in man's flight. But we do not intend to stay behind, and in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, the home, as well as the school. Technical institutions such as Rice will reap the harvest of these gains. And finally, the space effort itself, while still in its infancy, has already created a great number of new companies and tens of thousands of new jobs. Space and related industries are generating new demand in investment and skilled personnel. And this city and this state and this region will share greatly in this growth. What was once the furthest outpost of the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space. You should... Your city of Houston, with its manned spacecraft center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. During the next five years, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration expects to double the number of scientists and engineers in this area to increase its outlays for salaries and expenses to $60 million a year, to invest some $200 million in plant and laboratory facilities, and to direct the contract for new space efforts over $1 billion from this center in this city. To be sure, all this costs us all a good deal of money. This year's space budget is three times what it was in January 1961, <coughs> and it is greater than the space budget of the previous eight years combined. That budget now stands at $5 billion, $400 billion a year, a staggering sum, though somewhat less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year. Space expenditures. Space expenditures will soon rise some more, from 40 cents per person per week to more than 50 cents a week for every man, woman, and child in the United States. For we have given this program a high national priority. <coughs> Even though I realize that this is, in some measure, an act of faith, and vision, for we do not now know what benefits await us. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away,
think that uh, we want to pay what needs to be paid. I don't think we ought to waste any money, but I think. We ought to do the job. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done. Okay. Well, in, in, you know, in some ways, the point is not everything that he said, but the point is people don't even think this way anymore. The idea is it's too much money. Well, you think about what he said, computers. This is 1962. Where did computers come from? The space program and the military, to be honest. Where do most of these things come from? From scientific developments that are forced through that have no value to begin with. Almost everything we think of today as advanced scientific technology comes from the Manhattan Project, the space program, and where are we? It's, it, to me, you know, I'm, I'm a little up, not as, you know, I'm, I'm a little up in years, I won't admit to how much, but the, uh, you know, the space, we, we landed on the moon the last time in 1972. Now, right now, nobody can get to the moon. Nobody's really even thinking of going there other than the Chinese at any time soon. Now, you ask yourself, where have we gone? We're using food for gasoline. People are starving, and we've got 10 to 15% of the fuel in a car is biofuels. This is considered scientific progress. I will tell you something, the, f the food as a fuel for human beings is far more valuable than it is as a fu fuel for transportation. Now, people in Denmark, they ride bikes, they don't even, uh, you know, I'm impressed by the bicycle usage in Denmark. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> it's a good thing I don't drive because I would always forget to look for the bicycles. But, uh, uh, you know, the, we're, we're literally taking a situation where people don't have food and we're jacking the price of food up by ethanol and other, uh, you know, uh, products of that nature. It's completely, it's not only insane, it's immoral. It's killing people. Now, this is a moment I, I, there's a statement by Lynn that's, I think we still have copies back there? Yes. Yeah, some people probably already have it. I, I'm not, therefore, I'm not going to read it, but it, the, the, LaRouche opposes any military action. The danger of thermonuclear war is too grave. And he makes the point, any so-called so understandings with Russia or Iran, we, these things are not, are not real at this point. If we set off an increased conflict, who knows where it goes? But really, uh, what I want to get to is uh, the last points. Um, well, the present Anglo-Dutch global financial system is headed ultimately toward a general bankruptcy. 
And we're going to see a new, we, I expect to see, and Linda's made the point, probably by the end of this year and maybe sooner, you're going to see another blowout of the financial system. Nothing has changed. The rate of speculation is as great. The rate of derivatives is, if anything, greater. We have at least near to a quadrillion dollars in financial value against the gross domestic product, which is inflated at 70 trillion. So you got something like a 20, 25 to 1 ratio of debt to something you might call equity. There's nothing in this system, and it's not going to go on forever. This is the mistake that people make all the time. When you come to the end of a system or the need for a fundamental change, the great problem, people always say, what's the problem in humanity? The great problem in humanity is we think of ourselves as animals. We live by our senses. We don't think of the future. It's all about, oh, maybe, maybe the, whatever happens will avoid me. The classic question is, what's going to happen to my money? I'll tell you what's going to happen to your money. Poof. At some point, gone. Pensions, pensions in Detroit, they're paying 10 cents on the dollar. How much did people lose in the, two, in the 2008 crash? And then Lynn concludes, um, prevent this Syria attack at all costs. Implement Glass-Steagall immediately and new prospects for global stability are immediately available. The United States has the opportunity to partner with China. The world is a mess and we need a factor of stability. The Chinese know that a further collapse of Europe and the United States assures the collapse of China. Combine Glass-Steagall with a cooperative global crash effort to achieve fusion power and the conditions driving the world to a war of extinction can be eliminated altogether. In principle, this looming war can be stopped by a relatively small number of people who understand how to carry out an effective flanking operation. The logic of the current Obama policy trajectory is that if you let it run its course, we are in danger of thermonuclear war. Russia has been put in a corner, and any further actions can provoke an unrestrained response. So far, Putin, although he is in a touchy situation, is acting with restraint. Now, one of the problems you have in the United States is that you have this insane anti-Russian hangover, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the same thing that Roosevelt was accused of because he tried to deal with this uh, very difficult alliance during World War II. He, basically, Roosevelt was balancing between two empires. The Soviet Empire, which had an imperial, uh, although autarkic outlook, and the British Empire. And Churchill was demanding that the empire be maintained. And so to, be, to win the war, he had to keep this together. And to the degree he uh, worked with Stalin, he was accused of being a communist. To the degree he worked with, he uh, worked, uh, uh, tried to keep Churchill under control, he was viewed as, uh, you know, defending the financial system. He didn't either. Roosevelt's whole impression, uh, whole conception was completely uh, different. It was what I referred to as the American system. What do we mean by credit? It means you allocate funds to the future and you set in motion economic processes. You make sure that, no, that there is no speculation on monetary values alone. That's called regulation. You separate the system. You bankrupt Wall Street. In fact, we don't need Wall Street or London. We don't need speculation on future values that are unregulated. We don't need any of this. And indeed, we had a different system that was uh, in the United States under Roosevelt, and we were at the point of implementing a totally different relation amongst nations. Roosevelt knew that we needed to have a dialogue amongst sovereign nation states on economic policy and that development of the underdeveloped sector and other areas of the globe were the only way to achieve peace. Cardinal Nicholas Cusa, the founder of modern science in Pace Fide, makes, uh, in a very developed sense, points out that despite all the religious differences, 
these, their underlying principles on the, on the positive side that unite all of the religions. We have similar, the, the peace of Westphalia that saved Europe from further destruction was premised on the idea of no retribution and peaceful develop, economic development. If Pope Paul VI, the name of peace is development. This was Roosevelt's outlook. This is LaRouche's outlook, and this is what he and his uh, Helga have fought for. Now, I can tell you that in the United States, we have a huge battle. And it's not a futile battle. There are three bills, one in the Congress and two in the Senate, on Glass-Steagall. Now, to give you a sense of Gla there's 75 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. There's 10 co-sponsors in the Senate. Now, it's even possible to force this to the floor for a vote without going through the normal rigmarole. That is, if 218 congressmen sponsor it, they can force it to the floor for a vote. Uh, similar things are true in the Senate. Now, to give you a sense of this, already the bankers, that is J.P. Morgan, I'm talking about, you know, the local bank is one thing. But I'm talking about the Wall Street financiers, the London financiers, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and so forth. These banks are completely freaked out about Glass-Steagall. On the one hand, they say it can't get through, it won't work, it didn't cause the crash, but we, we're hysterical about not having it. And so they've deployed people to state legislatures like in Delaware, or in California, where the head of the California Banking Association called up the sponsor of the, a resolution in support of Glass-Steagall and told him, you know, you, you have to withdraw this. Uh, it'll destroy the banking community. Jamie Dimon, the head of Morgan, told the governor of Texas that it could cost them 30,000 jobs. They came to the Atlanta Conference of uh, State Legislators and threatened people threatened jobs, threatened states. Now, I, I would propose to you I, that when the, uh, the normal, the, these people normally like to lurk in the shadows. They like to stay unknown. If they come openly, publicly in their own name against uh, Glass-Steagall, not only does it tell you how important it might be, but it also tells you that it could pass. And I think we're in a situation in the United States on the war, on the economy, on Obama, where the American population, which does have a sense of changing history, which does have a sense of the evolving nature of the United States itself. That's what the United States Constitution says in the preamble, uh, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. More perfect union, uh, establish the general welfare, the security, the liberty for us and our posterity. In other words, the US Constitution is built on the conception of the entire population thinking of itself as contributing to the future of the republic, to future generations and indeed to make sure that future generations have the opportunity to create future generations. Now, in all, this, in all this is the identity of the human being. It, we're really talking about two systems. And it's not capitalism and communism. It's two systems about the nature of humanity. One system, John Locke, David Hume, Jeremy Bentham, Adam Smith, says that human beings are basically, perhaps, somewhat complicated animals. Or in the 20th century, even more uh, Cartesian, uh, somewhat complicated machines. Of course, Descartes thought animals were machines. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence. We're nothing but a set of neural networks, neural circuits, or we're animals. We're driven by pleasure and pain alone. That what appears to be the mind is an artifact, an epiphenomena of these 
desires, these pleasures, the immediate impulses, the immediacy of the senses. And the other view, the view embodied in the actual development of the human species, is that human beings are different. We obviously have a mortal form. We're, we're, we have a, uh, a, a biological organism that you could say is the seat or the home that carries the human mind. And the human mind goes beyond the senses. We can imagine things. We can create uh, things. In fact, classical art is a demonstration of the creative powers of the human mind. We create something new, something that's a completely different idea, wholly within the mind of, a, of an individual who then can communicate this to other human beings. So the mind exists with, as part of the individual, but it's not limited to the physical organism. For example, we communicate ideas over historical time. In a sense, ask yourself, uh, is Jose Anderson alive today? Well, physically he's not alive. I'm not talking about some strange spiritual substance. But he exists in you. To the degree you try to figure out what he's saying, to the degree you try to communicate that to somebody else, to the degree it becomes part of the culture that guides the way people think, to the degree it opens up the creative capabilities in your own mind, is Anderson alive? Is Johannes Kepler alive? If you study his discovery, and indeed, creativity itself involves sort of pushing into the future. Think of yourself as being on the track that leads to the necessary changes in the future, and you're acting on that now. That's human identity. What else, is, what else in one sense, what else is life about? You, tr you try to stay alive, for sure. But as the old cartoon goes, what was it all about? What happens when you come to the end of the mortal part of your life? What can you say to yourself? What do you think of yourself? I'm not asking what other people think. What do you think as you enter that point? Well, if you're human, and if you've done something that expresses the development of the human species, you have a right to say to yourself, I'm not finished. I may not be able to do it myself. But there are things that will happen that will use what I've done. Educating others, aiding others, <coughs> developing ideas, developing the necessary, take the, the, the breakthroughs that are needed to accomplish fusion power. That's not a given. I, I, one, of, one of the examples I've used in many things I, of, of the difference between money and real value is we visited a, a, a physics laboratory in the United States. And there are many different tracks to try to get fusion energy. There's laser <laughs> ignite, ignition. There's the tokamak that's being worked on in France as an international project. There's other smaller devices. Now, they're putting 15 billion into the, uh, the one in France. But this is a total international project. You heard some of the numbers from 1962 on the space program. You have to multiply those by 20 to compare them to today. So, uh, so that, that 15 billion, they say maybe by 2030. You know, that we've been going through this. Fusion has been a potential since the 1950s. And we've, been, and we've generally underfunded it to the extent that it won't happen. But that the, the the laboratories keep going on. So we were at this pr Princeton laboratory, and uh, we ran into a guy who was working on a new design. Or, well, not a new design, actually, it was an old design that he now upgraded and thought was potentially viable. He was very excited about it. But the program had been shut down. Now, why? Because of the budget cuts in the United States, 
they lacked $159 million. Now, $159 million is not small money to most of us. But when you realize we've bailed out a <coughs> AIG to the tune of $280 billion, when we had bailouts and guarantees of over $23 trillion, when the US Federal Reserve is now buying a trillion dollars worth of a, a, a year's worth of US government bonds and mortgage backed securities. And you don't have 159 million for a project that's essential to our ability to meet the needs of the globe. That tells you that a monetarist system has no meaning. It has nothing to do with the real economy. Why don't we have money for the cities and the schools, but we seem to have money for the financial system? That paradox should tell you that a monetarist system doesn't work. It's an oligarchic system. It's an imperial system. It's been done to colonies. It's been done over and over again. And now that system itself is going to die. It's in the process of dying right now, right before your eyes. In Europe, in the United States, China won't be able to survive it. And there's no reason for conflict between the United States and China. So we can change history. And that's the point that LaRouche has made. And frankly, we are organized from that standpoint. We mean what we say. Small numbers of people can make big changes. Roosevelt's policy was not a popular policy. When he did what he did in the state of New York, on pensions, on welfare, it was one of the first places in the United States it was done. He came in because, of course, you know, the Depression had, uh, was about to destroy everything. So history can be changed. Just as the people who went to the North America in the 17th century changed history, began to change history by creating the United States, by bringing certain ideas from Europe to the United States. And even under the conditions of the Eurozone, even under the conditions of the European Union, which is a, is a, a, a kind of technocratic fascism, bureaucratic, fa administrative fascism, destruction of nations, even then, if it, we have the response in Europe to developments in the United States, we can take the entire economy back from the people who have destroyed it. And there were many efforts to do this before. Because they, they succeeded partly but failed in the end, we still have the problem. Okay? So we have to take that. And, you know, I think the, the, the point to be made is if we don't do it, it's because we failed to be human, not because it was in the stars. All right? So we can take questions also for Lainey, yes. Tom.